My name is Edward Funk, and I'm going to do a series of podcasts. I don't really know how many uh, to tell you about uh, my aspirations to become a writer and some books that I've written. Um, but I think we're a few podcasts away from even talking about that. Uh, I'll just start out and say, in the same way David Copperfield uh, said in uh, the book David Copperfield, um, I was born. I was born February 11th, 1945. It was the same day as the Yalta Conference where Churchill, uh, Roosevelt, Stalin, they got together to discuss what post-World War II was going to look like. So, as you can imagine, that overshadowed uh, my birth. Uh, I was premature and under five pounds, and I heard that uh, my grandfather, Anna, who I never really knew, but that when he saw me that day, he cried because he'd never seen such an ugly baby. So, uh, I'm going to tell someone about my dad and my mom. My dad was born in 1906, and uh, say be 115 today. Eventually, he was the oldest of 11. Uh, back when Little House on the Prairie was a mainstay on TV, he loved watching that because <clears throat> that was his childhood. So you can get an idea of what that was like when he was in the second grade. Uh, he was at a one-room school. He won a spelling bee. And uh, that didn't just happen. His mother had such a priority for education that she had grilled him on that spell, spelling book, or what he used to call the speller, um, for weeks. And so that, that's how he managed to do that. But it tells you something about who he became. He was always a man very focused on education and reading and he never stopped until the last day of his life. Uh, he was a dutiful oldest son and uh, he was eventually he became the, the best corn husker which means picking corn manually. Uh, he even rented himself out to other neighbors when they were through on his dad's farm. but. That's not where his heart really was. So we say, really, he was, if he could have sat on the porch and read around the clock, that's what he would have done. What the schedule was like back then, they'd get up at four in the morning, start working either in the field or in the barn, and uh, then they'd come in for breakfast at six. And then they'd really work until sundown, and then they'd be in bed by eight, and that's what life was like back then. He liked to tell a story on Saturday night, they'd go to town. Uh, of course, if we're talking horse and buggy, and uh, what they were getting, the reason they had the shop in town, they had to get some mainstays like coffee and flour and sugar uh, and clothes or cloth material to make clothes. But then other than that, they were totally self-sufficient. I mean, everything else they ate, they grew themselves, uh, including the lard that they would render to fry the chicken. Okay. Oh, one other thing about Saturday night in this little town of Earl Park, uh, I don't think the population ever got more than 600 and a few more than that. And yet, at one point, it had six taverns. Uh, a lot of, see, before tractors, they, they imported a lot of hired hands from southern Indiana, Kentucky. And sometimes these guys, I mean, and I'm not saying the natives didn't join in, but uh, after midnight, there could be some pretty uh, dramatic fist fights. And uh, according to one of the hired men, uh, 
there'd be a couple murders a year. And if somebody got murdered, you know, they were generally from the South, and so they just put him in a burlap bag and threw him on the 4 a.m. flyer, and that was that. So that's what Dad's childhood was like. Okay. Now, Dad only went to the eighth grade formally. Uh, but he, he really wanted more of an education than that. So he went to the principal of the local high school and said, how can I test out him? And they said, well, no one's ever done that before. And dad said, well, can, can I do it? Can I set a precedent? So they said, well, yeah, okay, well, we'll give you a test for the freshman, sophomore year, uh, like in January. And then we'll give you a test for the junior, senior year, like in June. And so he worked very hard, studied very hard, uh, totally on his own, and passed that. So he had what we would call a GED back in those days. Now, Grandfather Funk, uh, who I remember well, he was just a, a, a kind elderly man in my memory, but he was... Uh, an ambitious man, nothing wrong with that. And he built a beautiful home, still a beautiful home, uh, in 1914. Uh, that was, I don't know if that there were any else in the neighborhood. There were a few that were close to it, but may, maybe I'm prejudiced, but, but I think this was the nicest one. So he had, he had built, he had mortgaged all of his land in the 20s to buy more land he eventually got up to 800 acres, um, but then he was faced with when the Depression hit. Let's see. Um, well, I might... Yeah, I got my notes in and out of order. He, uh, when the, the Depression hit, the mortgage man was breathing heavily on his neck, and so then he. Uh, He decided to sell a, a, a bunch of hogs, and so they shipped them to Chicago, uh, hoping he'd get enough for maybe a couple payments to the mortgage. And instead, the, uh, he got a call saying, Mr. Funk, the, the cost, your hogs didn't even bring the cost of the freight you have to pay to have gotten him to Chicago. So pretty desperate. But he came with a, a new plan, and that was to... Uh, Got to go retail. Uh, he, some of the older kids were working off the farm. My dad included worked in a dairy in Indianapolis. A couple of the older uh, sisters worked uh, as uh, staff in, in a banker's home, and so grandfather borrowed six hundred dollars from that banker and bought a used panel truck. And so then Uncle Bill was the salesman in the family. Um, they, he would go door to door in several little towns nearby selling chicken, um, steaks, um, I think some pork, and also uh, potatoes and, and, and other vegetables. And uh, it got to the point, Uncle Bill was so successful doing that, that he could just park one house on the block and everybody would come out and, and start purchasing. And, and that's what uh, got Grandfather out of the, the Deep Depression. So, okay. Oh, one other thing about that. When they were, they were so poor that uh, they could no longer buy coal. They all had to sleep on the floor in the living room where there was a fireplace. I mean, keep in mind there were 11 kids and two parents. Uh, and what else did they do? Well, anyway, you get the idea. Uh, now I've got to go back a page and 
figure out where I am here. So, well, anyway. Okay. I'm on to my mom. After all, that's... My mom was born in 1908. Her parents were Irish immigrants, uh, went from County Mayo, went from um, County Callaway. They, they met they, as adults here in this country. My grandmother, Hannon, who I remember well, I mean, she lived until I think about 1962, maybe. Um, she was a very serious person because she was one of 13 children that lived in a cottage, a rented cottage on 13 rented acres in Ireland. And they, they really knew longer, I mean, to where your stomach's growling. And so she never quite got over that. Um, so she, she stayed very soon. In fact, I remember I don't know how old I was, maybe seven or eight, and I was in her living room. And I said, Grandmother, am I Irish? She said, get that nonsense out of your head. Uh, you're an American. She, she, she had no romantic notions about the country that uh, she grew up in. So my grandfather, Hannon, was uh, more of a, he's kind of like dad in, in that, Education was such a priority for him. Um, he was. My mom was very attached to her dad, to his dad, because she. That's who she felt really loved her. Her mom loved her to the best of her capacity, but you could know what that could mean. So, but also her dad had a, a drink problem, so she grew up with both love with her dad and embarrassed with her dad and fearful of survival, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Oh, and then mom eventually, well, mom actually went to a monastery, a convent to become a nun. Uh, and they said, uh, well, what she said after like two years, adios, because she just didn't uh, agree with the uh, the idea of obedience. And if you knew her, this, this would make all the sense in the world. So then she came home. She got a job in a cigar factory. Uh, eventually, um, through the graciousness of a great aunt who had worked at the Theodore Roosevelt home as a seamstress, um, she put mom through college, and so mom became a social worker. So that's what she, she did as a career until she met my dad, um, somewhere towards the late 30s. Okay. Now, uh, that's mom. My own older siblings. Jim is six years older, um, and then Evelyn is like three years older, and Mary Margaret is like 18 months older. And so, you know, Jim being six years older, he might as well have been an adult, you know, when I was little. Uh, but Evelyn, Mary Margaret, and I were very close. And, uh, you know, we, we grew up on a farm. Our dad wasn't a farmer. Um, I'll have to backtrack and go into what that story was. Um, well, I'll do it right now. Back in the 30s, about 1935, Uncle Carl uh, was a very uh, kind of a futuristic farmer. He, he saw the promise of hybrid seed corn, and he'd been experimenting with it for a good 10 years. And then he felt confident that they could really start their own business. And it was Carl's idea, and uh, it never would have happened without him. Uh, but it took my dad 
to borrow $500 on its insurance policy to buy a facility in Kentland, Indiana, where they could operate their seed plant. And, and, and then they got Uncle Bill. And we mentioned a little earlier Uncle Bill's history as a salesman. And he was great at it, and he was a marketing man his whole life. Okay. So the farm we lived on, I'm kind of catching up here, was the um, nursery where they bred the hybrid seeds. And uh, it had a beautiful old farmhouse on it that was built in the 1880s. It had a kind of a modern addition in the 1930s. And uh, it was on five acres of, of land and plus a 160-acre farm. So, uh, of course, as kids, you never, uh, never really appreciate as, as I've observed, uh, gratitude is, is the least likely instinct. And we just took for granted that we had this beautiful home. And uh, it was like our own fiefdom. Uh, we had, as I say, orchards and uh, fields. To, there would be little roads walking through the fields. Uh, and, you know, there was no worry about where, where was anybody at any given time. Uh, because we were around somewhere, and, and it was just so safe that we gave it any thought. Uh, let me see now. Okay. So by the time it came to go to school, uh, for me, uh, I, was, I think it was about 1951 maybe, uh, Catholic grade school. But what was unique in this little town of Earl Park is how the Catholic school and the public school merged uh, their facilities. In other words, uh, the, the public school bus picked us up and took us home. And also for hot lunch, uh, we'd walk the little maybe block and a half from the Catholic school to the public school and have our lunch. So it, it, we were way ahead of our time when it came to Ecumenic, or whatever that word is. Um, now, oh, and there were about 10 people in our class. At least that's how many there were when we graduated from the eighth grade. And what, you, what I realized uh, as time went on is that these families, a lot of the people in my class uh, had been there for a few generations, just like my dad's family had, and uh, everyone had known everyone forever. So you really couldn't get by with too much, which was probably a good thing for me because uh, I was not that well behaved. Uh, I get in trouble, I had a big mouth, I was always saying that attention-seeking, saying the wrong thing. So, um, I remember one time my cousin Chris, he, he knew that things were tough for me. So, um, he said that he would give me personality lessons for a quarter. I thought, well, I guess it's worth a quarter. Now, speaking of Chris, uh, my best friends were my cousins. You know, Chris and I went to the same school in Earl Park. Then my cousin Dick and his sister Joy went to school, the Catholic school in Kettlin. But we, we saw an awful lot of each other. So, okay. Now, having mentioned Chris, Chris and I and, and our grandfather and uh, I think another aunt and uncle were on a party line and Uncle Paul would cut in and he'd say, you boys hang up, you have absolutely nothing intelligent to say to each other. And even as kids, we, called, we saw the humor of that. I mean, we loved Uncle Paul. Uh, he'd had a very difficult life, uh, but his family and extended family loved him. 
Okay. So, Uncle Paul was a classical pianist. Um, he was also gay, but, but no one in those days, I, mean, I don't think that word was even associated with being homosexual. And also, no one talked about being homosexual. It was, not only was it a criminal, it was a psychiatric diagnosis in those days. Um, so Paul, Paul was in and out of mental hospitals, but, but I think he also had some psychotic um, issues. So as I said, and, and the other thing I would say about that, he, he played the organ at the New Joy in his later years, which was a, a nice restaurant in Cal. And I just think everyone in there knew him, knew his story, but were very gentle with him. Uh, so, so I think you might think being homosexual in a small town could be the worst thing possible. But I think you might be surprised that people were generally understanding and kind. And that's, that was my impression, particularly looking back. Um, okay. Oh, now, talking about my dad and how smart he was and how much he loved education. Uh, in the late 40s, or maybe even 50, 51, he took an extension of, of law course to get his law degree from LaSalle University. It was supposed to be a three-year course, which he completed in 13 and a half months. And uh, he, he was able to use what he learned there very strategically. I've, I've written about that in, in one of the books that, that are available. Okay, so for high school, we were sent to St. Bede Academy in Peru, Illinois. Um, I think I got a very good education there. They had A, B, and C classes, and the A class was the most academic, the most college prep. Um, and uh, I was in A class. I, my, my ego loved that, but I didn't love how much harder it was. Uh, however, the, the school classes were, were actually my favorite part of the day because I really just hated the place. And it, it all had to do with my own bad attitude. Whereas other people made the most of it and had a good time, I, I would look at them and think, oh, those poor idiots, they, they don't know how miserable this place is. And yet I was the one who was miserable. So finally, by my senior year, I had a change in attitude. I was voted class president. And I really think the reason that happened is because the, the really popular guys had been voted for every office for three years up to, up to that point. And so I was somebody new. Um, oh, and I have to, you know, I'm talking about myself as a writer. Well, I'm going to back up a little bit to my grade school. I used to say at home, you know, to my mom's earshot that I, that I think I was going to be a writer. And, and she said, well, I really don't see you writing anything. And she had a good point. And when I was in high school, nobody was saying, oh, here's a young Hemingway. So um, what, what ability I have... Uh, certainly wasn't apparent at a young age. Not going to back up again because I mentioned my best friends from my cousin, but also in my seventh grade, I got a, a colleague named Goldie. Uh, and really, she was one of my best friends because we'd play, we'd play games uh, when a kid would come home after school. Uh, the this corn company would unload mounds of corn cobs uh, out, we call it with a ditch, it could be called a creek running through our farm. Uh, and so it's like a little mountains there. Goldie and I would run through that kind of hide and seek. And what was so funny, when she'd be chasing me and not quite know where I was, and all of a sudden come over a little hill, and there I was, the, the startled look in her eye, I, I would just laugh and it was, I know it sounds ridiculous, but I think she, she enjoyed that too. 
So, and when I was at St. Pete, uh, and I'd be home, we could get home one weekend a month, uh, she, she'd cry uh, when she saw me on a Sunday afternoon uh, walking out to the car with my suitcase in hand. So I have to include her and my best friends. Yeah, it, I think, oh, no, one more story before I end this podcast. Uh, Dad had a first cousin who was, how can I put it, nuts. And also he was the local priest. And if you were Catholic and you went to go to confession, uh, there was, uh, you could go to confession on uh, Sunday after Sunday morning before the second mass. And so I had some dating, nothing too extravagant, but uh, they, he, they'd always ask after you're through with your confession if you had any questions. And I said, well, yeah, I do have one question. Is French kissing a mortal sin? And this guy's big, he's six foot four, big man. He bellows out premarital relations before one is married is always a mortal sin. And then he gets gets up and leaves. Um, so there I am, I'm thinking, what do I do? I mean, did everyone really hear that? Uh, and I finally convinced myself that that they didn't. So I pulled that kind of purple drape back to get out of the confessional. And of course, every eye in church was peeled on me. Uh, who could believe it? Little Eddie Funk. So I think I'm going to end here before I get into uh, my college years. So thank you.